<laughs> yes, indeed. Dan Raven Ellison, um, thank you so much for agreeing to an interview. Um, we are sitting here in a gorgeous sunny afternoon in St James's Park, and you are the founder and campaigner of London, the campaign to make London a national park city. So I wanted to ask you to begin by describing what this brilliant campaign is and what it's all about. So yeah, it's a campaign to make London the world's first national park city, and it's not a national park in London or beside London. There's a national park beside Mumbai, a national park beside Toronto. It's the, the whole 1,600 square kilometres of London. Um, and essentially it came about because um, four years ago now I did a project where I did adventures all over the UK with my son. And we went through all the amazing, distinctive, important national parks in the UK. And we went through moorland and mountains and forests and all kinds of landscape, Maybe. apart from one, um, which is a an, an major urban habitat, a major urban landscape, which kind of surprised me because um, in terms of the family of national parks that represent all these, these areas, you know, 10% of England and 7% of the United Kingdom is urban. And perhaps counterintuitively, London is the most biologically diverse region of the UK with 14,000 species of wildlife. Precisely because people are here, unlike the monoculture that's existed in many other parts of the, the, the country. So it's, it's the combined factor of there being about 2,000 years of top-down policy by uh, the Royal Family, the City of London, the GLA, yeah. the Victorians, combined with literally millions of Londoners investing in grassroots campaigns and activism from uh, their balconies to gardens to parks that mean that London's one of the greenest cities in the world for its size, it's the world's largest urban forest, which is pretty remarkable. It is amazing. Um, thank you. And uh, what, would it, what would this entail and, and how, how's it going? Um, so first thing to say there is that the idea of the National Park City isn't just that I think that cities and urban habitats shouldn't be alienated from other kinds of habitats, right? Um, it's also looking at um, what the aims and visions of rural national parks are. And fundamentally they're about better conservation, uh, better quality of life and better opportunities for, for people and for, for, for business. And it's about taking that idea and putting that onto the urban landscape. Um, so, you know, a year after I started the campaign, I actually did a walk from the far south to the far north of London. Mm. And it was during the Friday of a school holiday, and I saw all, all kinds of wildlife, mm. and I didn't see any children playing outdoors at all. Really? Gosh. In any of the woods. Mm. Mm. Um, so one in seven London children hasn't played outdoors at all in the past um, year with their parents. Mm. Um, an and an interesting parallel statistic is that one in seven UK species are at risk of extinction. Now, in the context of a rapidly urbanising world, where more people live in cities than rural areas, where soon 80% of people in the world will live in cities, um, that, that balance of people not engaging with nature because either they're not allowed to or they don't choose to or it's not available to them, with the mass extinction of species worldwide, mm -hmm. is it's a, it's, a, it's a nexus, it's a balance that needs to be um, challenged and empowering people in cities to improve the quality of their lives, to improve their physical health, their mental health, um, and the quality of biodiversity in the city through everyday things that individual can do, individuals can do, mm. but um, in partnership with the public sector and the private sector is what the opportunity is here. That's wonderful, thank you very much. And I understand that Sadiq Khan made a commitment when he was campaigning to become mayor that he would like to see London become a national park city and um, I wonder whether he is, is acting on that promise and uh, thinking about it at least. Yeah so it's it's a grassroots campaign mm. um, what we've done is we've come up with our own definition for a national park city which is this new kind of mm. uh, national park and what we said in the grassroots campaign is that if we have the support of two-thirds of London's local politicians mm. and the Mayor of London and the London Assembly support us, mm. that would be a significant enough mandate to show we had a large constituency of support to make this vision a reality. And all the key mayoral candidates in the last election supported us, so mm. Zach Goldsmith, Sadiq Khan, uh, Caroline Pigeon, um, um, and Sadiq Khan is now Mayor. And it's not only his manifesto, it's already been written into the uh, environment the mayor's environment strategy. It's already go being embedded into tenders that are going out from Transport for London. Gosh, right. um, and there are many people, both in the charitable sector, public sector and business sector, who are 
already implementing ideas around the vision of the National Park City. Mm. So it's very alive and my estimate would be that by 2018, 2019, that you know we could have signs really? on the edge of London saying, you know, welcome <laughs> to London. Welcome to the Greater London National Park City. Yeah, why not? Why not? Mark Watt said to me in an interview, you know, when I come home from the world cities, which he does often, um, working for the C40, um, he does notice how green London is as he flies in. Um, and we do all love and cherish London's wonderful green spaces, of which this St James's Park is one. On the other hand, I was on a, in a tall building in the city last night, and I looked as far as the eye could see, and for a lot of what I saw, I saw very little green. I saw a lot of urban building. I saw Where support, was the building? Uh, the building was in the city of London. Um, wow. Well, there we go. So yeah. that solves that one. But, I mean, I... It, would this equate to more uh, green areas? Would it more funding for green yeah, spaces? Yeah, okay, so there's, there's two parts to that. Firstly, um, firstly, this idea is about the entire landscape, buildings as well. Yeah. Um, you know, pigeons and peregrine falcons, they kind of like the grey stuff. <laughs> there were lots of, yes, um, but yeah. Even scorpions in South Bank and that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's acknowledging the value of the grey and the green. But it's saying, yes, right, 47% of London is, is green, physically green. Another two and a half is blue, so 49.5% of London is green and blue. Mm. In terms of like visions around half Earth, yes, I think that we can make the majority of London physically green. That's one of the things that we persuaded Sadiq to put into his really, ma yeah. manifesto. And interestingly, so 24% of London is gardens, 45% mm. of those gardens are paved over. Mm. If 5% of every grade area of garden was greened or blued, mm. we'd make half of London green and blue. Mm. Mm. But mm. The quality of the green really matters. So, a very large amount of London's green space mm. is just lawn. Mm. Like to be honest, when I look at Hyde Park, often I just wonder, like, what's it doing? It's like mm. people go there as a tourist, and it's just like a big lawn. It's lovely mm. from the air, but mm. Mm. Um, a lot of London's green space um, is fairly homogeneous parkland, mm. and where dogs are prioritised, there's more dog poo space than there is space for mm. for, for food growing or for children to play. Mm. Mm. Um, there is a massive opportunity to improve the quality of our green space. So it's not just saying we want more no. green space, yeah. we want higher quality with more functionality for, um, for, for, for play and for recreation, different activities, but it's also recognising the importance of that space for urban resilience, right? Mm. So mm. in terms of climate change, if we want to have a more resilient city in terms of dealing with issues around fluctuating temperatures, um, changes in uh, water supply, both in oversupply or undersupply, green space and having better uh, blue space can help to uh, mm. help us to deal and tackle with each of those different um, challenges. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, across London, mm. there are thousands of people doing fantastic things already. Mm. So um, the real opportunity with the National Park City is to inspire and to encourage more demand for the good stuff mm. and for the people who can deliver that good stuff mm. so that we can both catalyze what we know what works mm. and also spread it out across the city far more. So I can name a number of places across the city where there are fantastic functional streets where children play outdoors, mm. where the urban cats look like countryside cats and mm. the urban canyons are alive with the sound of birdsong. Mm. But mm. they're in small places and what mm. I can imagine is a city where everywhere is like that but it's about increasing that demand um, and that's partially about uh, what individual people can do it's partially about what business can do but just one interesting parallel when you look globally at philanthropy um, you know Central Park got 100 million dollars uh, from one philanthropist the Garden Bridge has got 175 million pounds from various philanthropists yeah uh, green space grants into London last year was just like 30 million pounds so there's opportunity to increase investment from business, from philanthropy, but the, the greatest investment will be just through the scaling up of thousands of people doing things in their gardens and how that then translates to the landscape. Thank you. Kind of ranting at you. No, you're not. No, it's absolutely brilliant. And I wanted to ask you, everybody has a role to play in this. Mm -hmm. um, Councillors, presumably, can do stuff within their immediate political context. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't really ask you about the royal family, but it, given that Buckingham Palace is right behind you, presumably yep. there's a role for some of, if not the royal family themselves, for the residences and so on to play. I'm grateful for your thoughts on that. Um, but also what other actors can do. You mentioned businesses and the like. 
Can you give a flavour yeah. of what different actors so and constituencies can do? There are three core aims for the National Park City. One is around making the city uh, physically greener, more biodiverse, more species um, rich, bringing nature to people. The second one is about getting far more people outdoors, connected to nature, and enjoying London's outdoor heritage. And outdoor heritage means anything that's outdoors, including you know music festivals and Kayleys and whatever we want to do outdoors. And the third one, which is around a new um, identity for London. Okay, so think about that identity at a time when we're experiencing um, Brexit and so much sort of separation in the world at the moment. The National Park City identity is partially about saying, um, um, about having one identity for Londoners that's not about London being a financial centre or a cultural centre or um, a political centre, of which it is all those three things, but also as an ecological centre in people's hearts and minds. Um, and a crucial actor in that will be schools. So one of the things we want to do is have a, a National Park City curriculum where zero through to 16 year olds um, learn about, through experiences, um, learn what it means to grow up in a National Park City, um, um, learn what that means in terms of their nature of the environment, and it'll be those people in a generation's time who will really catalyse things in an exciting way, I think, even more um, um, than, our, than our generation. But the other opportunity in terms of identity is about how London projects itself to the outside world. Again, it's already seen as a capital and as a centre across all those other sectors and spheres. But, you know, we have in this city uh, uh, universities, museums, associations, uh, colleges, uh, landowners who have been at the forefront of innovation around gardening and green space and nature for hundreds of years. But no one has really articulately wrapped that up in a package that can express that to the outside world in a really engaging and exciting way. And the National Park City does exactly that. It's about saying this stuff really matters too and this is how um, we're doing that. Um, so then in terms of who the other actors are, yes, there are political actors. So um, at the larger scale, it's that City Calm can put things into the London plan, uh, which means that from the top down, people are thinking about how the city is designed in the future to, to, to increase green space and biodiversity and all this functionality. But for the grassroots up, you know, we're specifically talking to councillors because they will be, in, be here for generations to come and they um, control the local budgets at the street level that will change the street furniture and make decisions around parks. So from politics, from the grassroots to the top down, um, we can have this pincer movement in policy around, uh, around green, greening the city. In terms of business, I think that where, where the environmental movement often gets things wrong is thinking that because we have something that's good, that therefore you should have it a bit like a library. I call it fragoire environmentalism, you know. But in reality what you want is for people to understand the value of these spaces and the value of spending time in nature or, or being outdoors. And so demand it. So they, they ask for it and they want high quality. So in schools, parents aren't just going in and saying, well, how did, you know, Sarah do in uh, maths and science? But they're also asking questions about the quality of outdoor learning mm. and their opportunity to be well in school from being outdoors and being active outdoors as well. That's, that's got to be part of that negotiation. But the reason why I mentioned business there is because more than the public sector or the third sector, it's business that's often able not just to provide um, money to finance change where there's a, a good partnership and it has to be a good partnership, but, but more to the point, create a culture of demand where something is fashionable mm. and so people want it in turn. Mm. And it is business that tends to have the skills and the innovation, the ability to communicate those things in a way that then drives the demand that then makes things happen. Mm -hmm. um, clearly there's a really important link there to, to CSR and thinking about the social responsibility of those businesses in terms of them not just greenwashing this, mm. whole, this whole process. Um, but another example of why, why business is important there is um, you know, the, when um, the, the government and the Mayor of London and local councils are drafting up policies around looking at um, natural capital accounting mm. um, to look at the value of green space or they're looking at plans for greening the city. Mm. In the All London Green Grid and many other policy documents, uh, they, they stop um, at the edge of public space, mm. where the public realm or the public space that they control. And you just take London, so I mentioned before 
you know, quarter of London is gardens and the private space. Mm. Another chunk then is corporate private space. Mm. If you're omitting from your thinking about how you green a city and how you make the city more resilient, if you're omitting those spaces, mm. then, I mean, that just makes no sense. Mm. You've got to think about the city and its watershed as a whole, mm. of which business are a really important, you know, component. Mm. Um, but, you know, within all this, my strong belief is that the, the greatest change to be made is around individuals, their gardens and their balconies. Really? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Amazing. So you think about the expansion of Airbnb, mm. uh, Deliveroo, Uber, you know, these are all mm. systems that are about mm. acknowledging where many people can contribute to something, where there is a surplus of something else, and then as a result, you know, you're able to rapidly scale up. And I think nature conservation needs to do exactly the same thing. So in a rural national park, or in a rainforest in Borneo, you're going to have one, or, like a very, very small number of people who have a lot of power over a large area. Mm. The thing that's very, very different about the city is that you have millions of people who have lots of control over um, millions of smaller areas. Mm. So there are 3.8 million gardens in London. Mm. Mm. So if you want to have a plan for greening London mm. and increasing the urban canopy, you need to be talking to those people mm. as well as the people who look after the streets. Fantastic. And how do you reach those people? Through campaigns, through public awareness, um, celebrities? I mean, how many people in London at the moment do you think are familiar with your wonderful quixotic <laughs> campaign? How do you increase them? I don't know how many people are aware of it. We, yeah. ran an, we ran an independent poll through the University of Lancaster that showed that 85% um, of Londoners think that it's a good idea, Yes, which is good. That's pretty good stuff. That's a fantastic stuff. statistic. <laughs> But that was a poll of 1,075 people, and yes. we all know where polls can be, <laughs> to be honest. Um, um, you know, we've, we've, we've been on the front cover of Time Out and Time Out are supporting us. You know, we've been, we've had, you know, a fair amount of coverage in London and had um, um, only pushback from a, a handful of people who have got... Um, um, interesting points of view, but they are a handful of people who um, have voiced concerns out of, a, out of a city of you know, millions of people. So we're doing very well. They're unlike something like the, as contentious as the Garden Bridge, which had a very vocal lobby against it, we have a very, lo a very vocal lobby you know, for what we are doing. So I think we've got local political support, we've got uh, um, like uh, regional uh, government support. Um, and I think we have a lot of support within the population of London when people learn about it. But there is a job to tell more people about what we're doing. But then, you know, that's that's the fun of the game, really. <laughs> so the, the, our strategy moving forward is that we're setting up a, a charitable foundation, the London mm. National Park City Foundation, which will do two things across its three areas. So the greening in London, getting more people outdoors, and this new identity. Firstly, do a multi-generational, long-term, and deep campaigns that are city-wide. Mm. So by bringing together business in the third sector, awesome. pick together a number of metrics that we really want to work on, like for example, connecting 100% of children to nature, which is one of our aims, mm. and using communications across the city, digital and print, um, and using celebrities and whatever else mm. to get those messages out. Um, but seeing the issues we're looking at as being you know, intergenerational problems, so they're not going to be solved overnight. Okay. Um, so citywide campaigns that, at, at the moment, smaller environmental organisations on their own aren't doing. Mm. So that is one of the ways in which we'll drive demand. Mm. Um, other parts of those campaigns that are more grassroots would be things like physically taking people from housing estates with awful green space, taking them to housing estates where the wonderful things are happening, mm. to drive the hunger, to show people about you know, what it is they, they can do. Mm. Mm. So driving the demand that way. But at, at, then at the other end, um, pulling in as much funding as we can mm. so that we can um, fund grassroots initiatives that are already happening in the city, that are already successful, that are mm. already great, but are underinvested in or mm. underknown. So mm. we want to highlight those things and provide um, more funding and support for those to both catalyze where they are, mm. where that's needed, but also to spread. Um, so a good example of that was with um, the Girl Guides and uh, doing some work and they were pointing out how people are always talk about innovation. Mm. It's like they were saying, but we've been doing this for a hundred years <laughs> and what we need is we need more volunteers and we need to yeah. get more girl guides into certain places. But we have a model that's great for connecting girls to nature. Yeah. So so it's not necessarily about new ideas. Sometimes it's about taking an idea that's been around for a thousand years yeah. and just trying to really embed that in places where it doesn't currently exist. Yeah. But this city isn't short of the expertise or the talent of the ideas. It's short, in my belief, of 
the, the, the demand for quality in the places where that quality is needed and then supply of investment to actually then help that, that those things embed, yeah. which is exactly what a big grand vision like a National Park City can do, That's not just it. in London but elsewhere. That's really wonderful, Dan, and it, it is a story as well. One of the many things I love about your project is that it's telling a story about what London might be, what it could look like, and, and, and there's a sort of... It's a, the narrative is very appealing. It, it, I'm, I was immediately taken by the idea when I first um, heard you talk about it. And maybe we need more stories like this, which can sort of win an argument, win people over to sustainability and to the environment. But also, it's a flexible idea that, mm. that yes, well, we have maps that, that tell people what they can be doing in their community, so that there is some specifics. But but it's about not alienating people and having a broad vision that many people can buy into. And you know, you're saying about who are the different actors you can get involved. There are about 400,000 people, I think, who live in Britain's national parks already, the 15 rural mm. national parks. Mm. And the, you know, the vast majority of exciting activity that happens, the national park won't even know about. Mm. People are just doing things in their gardens, or they're a business with a and b giving someone some advice, or it's someone who set up a, a new tour to go and check mm. out a lake, or a new website. The most exciting innovation that happens around the national park city will have nothing to do with those people mm. You know, sat in an office trying to make the whole thing work. It'll be through the conversations over fences and businesses just choosing to do cool things. And that's where I think the most energy will come from in reality. Mm. It's just having the broad vision that's flexible enough that people can just get on and do stuff. Mm. So good. A couple of more trivial but affectionate questions. What, what drives you to, not trivial perhaps, what, what drives you to do this? You know, what, what's at the heart of it in, in your terms of your own motivation? <laughs> Um, I think I, I grew up in a military family sort of moving between different countries in the world mm. and I think that exposure showed me um, the incredible social, economic, environmental injustices mm. that exist in the world mm. Mm. Um, and I think that we need to do all we can to tackle those things. Mm. And in the face of climate change and the world, the, the, the scale of the world's population, um, I think the cities are the solution in terms of how we can best accommodate very, very large numbers of people on the planet in a sustainable way, that yeah. in a resilient way. And so we need to make cities as livable and as healthy as possible mm. if we're to avoid um, conflict and as many people as possible are going to live happy, long lives for as long as they can, mm. um, they can as well. So I think it's that upbringing, being aware of those injustices and, and really wanting to make sure that, um, that cities can be the best they can. And you know, some people can argue that, that, that doing the National Park City in London is, um, you know, it's unfair because there's other cities in the UK or elsewhere in the world that could have it more. Mm. There's two reasons for London in my mind. Firstly, it's where I live, mm. and I believe in practicing what you preach where you live, mm. you know. Mm. But secondly, London is um, politically and economically a very complex place with a very significant global, you know, world status. If we can make it work in London, mm. then many other cities would technically be much easier actually to, mm. to sort of implement some of these ideas mm. in. So those are two reasons for doing Thank it you. in London. And you mentioned also your walk across the nation's national parks with your son. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm about to have a son of my own, my first. And I wondered what what, what dimension that had brought to your own efforts and, and also how he's involved in this effort. I don't know how old he is now. Um, he's 13. 13, oh, there we are. Yeah, well, he was part of this sort of mm. inspirational trip that led to the National Park City campaign. Mm. Um, He's a bit rebellious at the moment. He's a lovely boy, <laughs> and he's really awesome. But I think maybe um, um, he he's sort of a bit indifferent to this stuff at the moment. That's like, right. Like many yeah. teenagers well, are to what their yes. parents are doing. Yes. So I'm a fanatic geographer, and I'm very mm. pleased that he's just chosen geography as oh, one of his GCSEs oh, at school. Yes. I think geography yeah. is crucial to our understanding of yes. these uh, very important issues. Um, um, but I think that, that his involvement in my life has definitely shaped my importance, the importance of um, 
investing in children to make sure that they have the very best possible start so that you know not only do they live the best possible lives but actually we have societies that are the very best they can be as well mm. and actually they've often neglected the very smaller people in our society yeah. you know people all put all the money into yeah. their a level or gcse um age children when it's all about the first three years of life really which is when we often have you know the poorest paid worst qualified people looking after our children which is yes. just a bizarre state of affairs very interesting. Final question for you, two questions. One is, you know, how optimistic are you that you're going to um, be able to deliver this wonderful idea? And the second is, you know, what's your favourite natural area of London, given that you've walked right across it? And, yeah. What was the first question? Uh, how optimistic are you that uh, we're going to be able, you, we are going to be able to deliver on this, this wonderful vision? Um, I'm extremely optimistic. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think it's completely doable. Mm -hmm. um, Trevor Sandwith, who is the IUCN, um, uh, director for uh, um, protected areas, mm. I, I believe is his title. Yes. So that he imagined it working in in Delhi and Rio and Toronto mm. and a number of cities. Mm. Yeah, I think we could completely make make this work. Fantastic. Why not? You know. Why not? And your other question was your favourite area of London from a natural environmental point of view. <laughs> so, I really enjoy Boston Manor. Boston Manor is this park near where I live. It's um, it's in Hounslow. It's under the flight path of Heathrow. Mm -hmm. Uh, the M4, a flyover, goes over the top of it. Mm. It's banked by uh, the Grand Union Canal, where the River Brent, which is probably one of London's mangiest rivers, uh, sort of in, entwines with that. There's a historic mansion. There's some like completely mangly sort of wild woodland on this mm. this island. There's some parkland that's overlooked by the GlaxoSmith Klein building, and it's just this microcosm of. The best bits of London's wild wildness, where you can find like water voles and kingfishers and stuff, mm. a reminder of the pollution and the murk, the noise of the cars, which reminds you of the challenge, but it's a very mm. honest sense of mm. the, the environment. Mm. But it's also this really stunningly beautiful mm. sort of cityscape in its own right as well. So it's this yeah. microcosm of yeah. every bit of London in this sort of green space. That sort of it's challenging, but. Will Self once challenged an MP who was talking about the beauty of some homogenous sort of business like landscape. He challenged him to say, you should widen your aesthetic lens in terms of seeing the beauty of, you know, these, these other kinds of landscapes. And so that, I like that mantra really, the idea of widening your aesthetic lens. Um, when I, my, in my last project, when I walked across all the cities and national parks in the UK, I was wearing an EEG measuring my emotions and what was interesting about that is it looks like What's an EEG, sound for? An EEG. Um, I can't pronounce the word yeah, basically it's his brain wear oh, yes, which yes. measures six different emotions in my brain by looking at the, uh, the electric activity in different parts of the brain so it can infer your different emotions and I'm mapped out across this 1648 kilometer journey how my brain reacts to different places and we're still looking at the results at the moment but it looks like my brain um, um, was um, interested and, and relaxed and, and focused in like a really like good way um, um, as much well, uh, um, most of all out of all the different kinds of areas and deciduous woodlands more than anywhere else so more than moorland or wetland or uh, 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 suburbia or the inner city but whether I was going through a small area of deciduous woodland in a city or a large area of deciduous woodland in the countryside it didn't matter so in terms of Boston Manor, yeah. and the fact there's this sort of bit of mangly old bit of woodland that's not particularly inspirational, but nonetheless it's sort of, it's there. Mm. There's something really wonderful to think that that little bit of woodland can be mm. just as beneficial to children, just as beneficial to us, maybe, maybe, mm. as going to some big expansive place. Certainly I would have thought if you were a baby and you've got no sense of mm. scale in yes. that way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a nice reflection. It is a lovely reflection. Well, Dan, thank you so much for the interview and all the best wishes for your fantastic project. Thank you.